Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Wall Street Journal's book club. And thank you so much to our host, Neil Gaiman, who is here with us today to talk about James Thurber's The Thirteen Clocks. Um, it was my first time reading this book, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and one of the things that I thought was most fun about it was reading it aloud. Um, and I was hoping, Neil, you could talk a little bit of how you first came into contact with this book and why you chose it. I came into contact first with the 13 Clocks when I was about eight years old. Um, it was a puffin book in the UK, and uh, it was a double edition, the 13 Clocks and the Wonderful O together, illustrated by the always amazing Ronald Searle. And it was Ronald Searle's illustrations that drew me to it initially, because I loved his books that he'd done with Jeffrey Willens, like Whiz for Atom Atoms, and I'd seen some of his um, Centrinians illustrations, and I just loved so. So um, seeing a, a, a weird book with a duke with an evil hat on the cover, and I, I thought I had to, to get this. Um, and I read it and just fell in love. I thought this is the best book. I I was reading my friend Stephen Burns' copy, and I saved up my pocket money, and I went and I bought my own copy. That's how much I liked it. <laughs> and, um, and then, I, as, as time went on, I read it to my children, as you do, and was hugely grateful that I had children. Um, there was definitely, you know, in the life of each of my children, there was probably about a period of, of a week when I was convinced the only person reason for having children was to read them the 13th time. Because <laughs> um, you get to read it aloud, which is just the best thing in the world. And then um, I moved to America. And moved to America, home of James Thurber. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of America's great humorists, one of the, the, the towering figures of the 20th century, author of such amazing short stories as The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, The Catbird Seat, um, his amazing book, The War Between the Sexes, uh, fantastic uh, New Yorker cartoonist. He did these, these weird, sort of slightly lumpy looking people and, and glum dogs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and these fantastic cartoons. And, and so I'm coming to the home of, of Thurber. And people would say to me, what are your favorite books? And I would list off some of my favorite books. And then I would say, and The Thirteen Clocks by James Thurber. And they would say, what? Or sometimes <laughs> for variety, they would say, who? And I'd say, James Thurber, Thirteen Clocks, childhood classic. You must have read it. And they would say, nope, never heard of it. <laughs> so. I thought, this is very peculiar. And I went out into the world to try my copy of The Thirteen Clocks. Um, the one that I bought when I was eight was now living in a plastic bag, living in a sandwich bag, because all of the pages had just sort of, it had been read so much into form. <laughs> and I wanted a new copy, so I went online. This was the early, early, nascent days of the web. This was like 1997. Um, suddenly you could order things on the web. So I went to order myself a copy of The Thirteen Clocks from Amazon.com or from Powell's.com, I think, which is where I was buying books in those days, and they didn't have it. And eventually I found a copy in Canada hmm. and uh, bought a copy in Canada. And I thought, this is just weird. Here is this classic. Here is this fantastic book. Here is this magical, amazing, remarkable, and wholly unique book, which as far as I'm concerned, you know, your life should not be considered complete if you have not read this, especially as a child. Um, and it's absolutely unavailable. So that fascinated me. That's really interesting. And, and when you um, read the book aloud to your children, and I think you said to friends and other family members, what were some of the nuances that you noticed um, that were sort of brought out by that, that reading experience? Well, a lot of it, actually, is how much poetry mm -hmm. is hidden in the prose. Um, Thurber just takes too much fun. 
he's having a wonderful time with his words. And he, you know, this is, it's interesting because there is the received wisdom of Thurber is that once he went blind, he, like Samson losing his hair, he lost his powers. He was not as good after he lost his eyesight. And for me, what fascinates me about the 13 clocks is it's as if having lost his eyesight, he's putting everything into the sound of the words. He's building, um, he builds poems, he builds, he plays with all of the techniques of poetry, of assonance, of onomatopoeia, of alliteration, um, internal rhymes, um, of, of just making words cluster together, and then he invents perfect words. You know, wow. I will slit you from your guggle to your zatch, and you go, no, that is not a good thing to be slit from. <laughs> it doesn't really matter if you know where they are or not, because nobody does, because it's something you just get slit from. Right. And things are both funny and, and painful at the same time. I, I was, I, but when, when we talked right at the beginning, I was saying, you have the running line about feeding people to the geese. Mm -hmm. every, every, everything else, every other, every other evil um, duke in literary history feeds people to the dogs. <laughs> but, but Thurber feeds people to the geese, which on the one hand is funny, and on the other hand, if you've ever met an angry goose or a bunch of them, is worse than dogs. <laughs> As I say, very, dogs, very frightening. You, can, you can reason with dogs. Geese are just mean. <laughs> your farmyard mean. So uh, while we're on the subject of Thurber's language, we were hoping that you could read a favorite passage from the book. I would love that. Um, okay, so what I tend to do, it's not a book that has favorite passages for me. It, it's, it's a giant favorite passage. The entire <laughs> thing. Once you start quoting, you're doomed. But um, over the years, probably four or five times now, I have found myself in situations where I had somebody at the other end of the telephone who was just heartbroken and nothing could be done. And at that point, I always just grab the 13 clocks and start reading it to them from the beginning <laughs> uh, because that kind of works. So if it's okay with you, I'll read you the first couple of pages. That would be great. Once upon a time, in a gloomy castle, on a lonely hill, where there were 13 clocks that wouldn't go, there lived a cold, aggressive duke, and his niece, the Princess Saralinda. She was warm in every wind and weather, but he was always cold. His hands were as cold as his smile and almost as cold as his heart. He wore gloves when he was asleep, and he wore gloves when he was awake which made it difficult for him to pick up pins or coins or the kernels of nuts or to tear the wings from nightingales. He was six feet four and forty-six and even colder than he thought he was. One eye wore a velvet patch, the other glittered through a monocle which made half his body seem closer to you than the other half. He had lost one eye when he was twelve, for he was fond of peering into nests and lairs in search of birds and animals to maul. One afternoon a mother shrike had mauled him first. His nights were spent in evil dreams, and his days were given to wicked schemes. Wickedly scheming, he would limp and cackle through the cold corridors of the castle, planning new and possible feats for the suitors of Sarah Linda to perform. He did not wish to give her hand in marriage since her hand was the only warm hand in the castle. Even the hands of his watch and the hands of all the thirteen clocks were frozen. They had all frozen at the same time on a snowy night seven years before, and after that it was always ten minutes to five in the castle. Travelers and mariners would look up at the gloomy castle on the lonely hill and say, time lies frozen there. It's always then. It's never now. The cold duke was afraid of now. But now has warmth and urgency, and then is dead and buried. Now might bring a certain knight of gay and shining courage. But now, the cold duke muttered, 
the prince will break himself against a new and awful labor, a place too high to reach, a thing too far to find, a burden too heavy to lift. The duke was afraid of now, but he tampered with the clocks to see if they would go out of a strange perversity, praying that they wouldn't. Tinkers and tinkerers and a few wizards who happened by tried to start the clocks with tools or magic words, or by shaking them and cursing, but nothing word or ticked. The clocks were dead, and in the end, brooding on it, the duke decided he had murdered time, slain it with his sword, and wiped his bloody blade upon its beard, and left it lying there, bleeding hours and minutes, its springs uncoiling and sprawling, its pendulum disintegrating. The duke lived because his legs were of different lengths. The right one had outgrown the left because when he was young, he had spent his mornings place kicking pups and punting kittens. He would say to a suitor, what is the difference in the length of my legs? And if the youth replied, why one is shorter than the other, the duke would run him through with the sword he carried in his sword cane and feed him to the geese. The suitor was supposed to say, why one is longer than the other? Many a prince had been run through for naming the wrong difference. Others have been slain for offenses equally trivial, trampling the Duke's camellias, failing to praise his wines, staring too long at his gloves, gazing too long at his niece. Those who survived his scorn and sword were given incredible labors to perform in order to win his niece's hand, the only warm hand in the castle where time had frozen to death at 10 minutes to five one snowy night. They were told to cut a slice of moon or change the ocean into wine. They were set to finding things that never were and building things that could not be. They came and tried and failed and disappeared and never came again. And some, as I have said, were slain for using names that start with X, or dropping spoons, or wearing rings, or speaking disrespectfully of sin. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was great. Um, and now we have a question from one of our book club members. Um, this is from Alexandra Alger, who commented on WSJ.com. And she asks, uh, what was your favorite part of the book when you first read it at age eight? And did anything, the total, for instance, scare you? Um, I don't think anything scared me in the book because the narrator's voice is so incredibly comforting. I found it much scarier as an adult, where it wasn't the total so much as the weird, haunted nature of the castle at the end, um, where the things that get the Duke, ah, oh, spoiler, um, there's, there's definitely some something there that felt more adult, more strange, and more wistful, and more weird. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when I was a kid, my favorite thing was the Gollocks. Uh, just meeting the Gollocks in, and, and the Gollocks taking us on his adventure and the Gollocks' dialogue where he talks about, you know, things that aren't and things that never were. Um, that was my favorite bit because it was just funny. And I loved the Gollocks. And I loved, I loved the drawings of the hat. I love Ronald Searle's drawings of the hat in the English one. I love uh, Mark Simmons drawings of the Gollocks' hat in the American one. There's, there's something glorious about the Gollocks. Great, great. Um, and one of the similarities that I found between your writing and 13 Clocks is that they both sort of deal in multiple genres and they kind of transcend these genre boundaries. Um, could you talk a little bit about the different genres in the 13 Clocks? Sure. Let's see. What have you got? Well, starting out, um, you have a fairy story. And the, the giant frame is the frame of a folk tale and the frame of a fairy story, but it's the frame of a completely self-aware fairy story. Mm -hmm. um, it knows, the narrator of the fairy story knows he's in a fairy story. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're already, just from hearing that bit that I read, you know you're in a metafictional construct. Um, to use long words, the characters know they're in a story. Uh -huh. and, um, and the story itself knows that it is a story. So you're, you're, you're sort of rather, you know, slightly ahead of your time there in a, in a kind of oddly postmodern kind of way. Um, you have a 
you have a quest tale going on. Um, you have horror. He takes a dash of horror, and it just runs through. You have out-and-out -out humor. It is a funny book, except when it's not. It doesn't mm -hmm. actually... He never follows the joke. He always follows the story, um, wherever that takes us. And we learn the difference between the transient tears of sorrow and the transient tears of laughter um, hmm. in this book. Which is really interesting because, you know, Thurber is somebody who only ever made people, who gave people the gift of laughter. Yeah, we have um, a question from one of our readers about laughter, actually. And uh, this is from Michael Fix, who commented on the Facebook page. He said, uh, laughter seems to have a negative connotation throughout the book, but only for the Duke. When the Prince and Sarah Linda depart, the Gulags tells them to remember laughter. You'll need it in the Blessed Isles of Ever After. At the end of the epilogue, Hark, the last spy at the castle, quote, thought he heard from somewhere far away the sound of someone laughing. And he asked, who might he have heard? Haga, the total, the Prince, and Sarah Linda? Um, and what, what effect does laughter have? Uh, what role does it play in the book? Oh, I think laughter, I mean, I, I love to think that the person he heard laughing was, was possibly James Thurber himself. <laughs> um, but it was probably the... Well, it, it, it's, it's, the it's the flip side of Ever After, is you get your... As a, as a prince and princess going off, you get your ever after, um, and it and it is should be one of unalloyed joy from here on out. Um, the duke is headed for doom, mm -hmm. and he gets he gets doom in his ever after. Um, but yeah, laughter. I think it would be very very easy to say that Thurber is somebody with. Um, a life that contained more than a little tragedy, um, including you know, losing one eye when young and the sight in both eyes when older. Um, you know, his, his, he did not have um, his, 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 his love life was a bit of a wreck. Um, he was, as he grew older, a towering figure, a towering literary figure who, who even started, I think, to take himself seriously, which is a terrible, terrible thing to be. <laughs> um, but who was taking himself seriously as a humorist and, and in the knowledge that the world doesn't take you seriously if you're a humorist, uh, which is a terrible thing. G.K. Chesterton, uh, who was an English writer, um, early part of the 20th century, um, Chesterton pointed out that the opposite of serious isn't funny. You know, the opposite of funny is not funny. Hmm. Um, <laughs> you can absolutely be serious and funny, but people think that you can't. And very often, if you want to say something huge and serious and important, the best way to say it is in a funny place and in a funny way and in a way that people remember. Um, you know, that, um, that, 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 that Stephen Colbert or John Stewart are funny does not make what they do less serious. Right. And I think the same is true of Thurber. But the way that the world tends to work, um, you know, if you were a comedian, if you were a funny person, if you write funny books, people will always ask, so when are you going to do something serious? Interesting. So uh, we have another question from a book club member, Mo Unger. Um, Mo says, was James Thurber thinking of pleasing a reader when he wrote this story, or was he writing for pure joy to please himself? Probably both, because all authors who write uh, write to please themselves. Um, but I think because there was a real Sarah Linda and he created a Princess Sarah Linda right at the beginning, he has to have been looking to please at least one person. 
Um, but you don't build a story like this. And you don't make every sentence. Um, you don't construct it with the amount of joy and poetry and fun that Ferber wrote this, unless you're actually really enjoying the hell out of it yourself. Right. Um, you know, it, it would be like a magic crossword puzzle. And, you know, I've written... Um, I actually, I have no idea. I was about to say, I've written some, a number of books, and I have no idea. But they <laughs> say, how many books have you written? And I say, I don't. <laughs> lots. Written lots. Um, and some of them, you find a voice. And you find a way of telling the story that is simply fun. And you look back on the book. Talking about Stardust earlier. Um, Stardust, for me, was a, a book that was just fun to write. It has a glorious narrative voice. Um, it's probably the nearest thing I've ever done to the 13 o'clock, in a weird kind of way, because it has a very, even though it's, it's much more formal, um, it's a fairy tale that knows it's a fairy tale. When, when you started writing Stardust, did you set out uh, to write in a certain genre, or did you sort of let it determine itself? I wanted, when I wrote Stardust, to write a story where um, I loved the idea of trying to write something that felt like it had been written before Tolkien. Because Tolkien... Um, you know, love him, loathe him, ignore him, changed everything. Uh -huh. And one of the things that he changed was he created the fantasy part of a bookshop. Now, if you go into a bookshop, you'll find the fantasy section, and that's where the fantasy books are. Sometimes it's science fiction and fantasy, sometimes it's science fiction, fantasy, and horror, but basically it's the fantasy section of the bookshop. And I was fascinated by the fact that pre-Tolkien, uh, before, you know, 1955-ish, if you were a writer and you wrote a fantasy, it just went into books, because there wasn't a fantasy section of the bookshop. Mm -hmm. so some of the most interesting writers who were working in the fantasy genre are uh, Lord Dunsany, uh, Sylvia Townsend Warner, James Branch Cavill, people like that. Their books were simply in books. They were being reviewed in the New York Times as books. They were, they were fiction. And the fact that they might have fairies in or, or whatever was simply, that's one of the things that an author can do. After it became a commercial genre, um, the whole thing kind of changed. And, and once it changed, you started feeling that there were rules. It was now a genre where, where you had to behave. And I just love the idea of seeing if I could find a voice that was from the voice before. Great. Um, well, here's a question sort of related to genre and this question of fairy tales and fantasy. Um, this is from uh, Courtney Bates Hardy, and she says, The 13 Clocks is very much like a fairy tale, so I'm wondering if you have a favorite traditional fairy tale. Ah, uh, I do. Um, I have a couple. Uh, there's one called the Juniper Tree, which is okay. really, really weird. Uh, <laughs> it involves cannibalism and uh, murder of parents, and also it's a proper Grimm's fairy tale. It's not as well known, I think, as it should be. Hmm. Um, so recommend the Juniper Tree. But my favorite of all of them. Um, is probably Hansel and Gretel, just because it's so dark. Uh -huh. and, um, I just did a, a retelling of Hansel and Gretel, very, very straight, but very, very dark, for Toon Books, to accompany some glorious illustrations by Lorenzo Matotti. Oh, great. And, um, and that, I think, comes out in November. And it was probably the only fairy tale that I could think of where I have no desire to change it or to do anything to it. Just, here, is, here is Hansel and Gretel. Let me tell it to you as I experienced it as a child and give it back to you and see if I can give you the same nightmares that I got. Great. Great. 
Um, okay, we have another question on the 13 clocks from um, Connie Ng. Uh, do you think Thurber wanted readers to feel pity for the Duke, or did he purposefully make him the villain of the story? Oh, I think he's made a glorious villain. Um, <laughs> I don't think, I think it's interesting because um, Thurber is, is straddling a fascinating line. Um, villains of fairy tales only exist to be villains. They have no inner life. They have no redeeming features of any kind. Um, you know, the queen in Sleeping Beauty, uh, the, the, the witch in Sleeping Beauty, the queen in Snow White, um, the witch in Hansel and Gretel. These are not people that you encounter and want to sympathize with. What you want to do is run away, and you hope they will get their, their just desserts in the end. <laughs> um, then, as, as time went on, and novels became more mimetic, as we, we started to try and write around the world, about the world, and, and stories are being created by fallen people, about fallen people, um, it became much more interesting to write villains who weren't villains. Um, or if they were, you could understand why they were villains. For me, I, I always like, wherever possible, to create, if I have a, a bad guy in a book, or a bad lady in a book, with a very few exceptions, probably Coraline is, is about the only one. Um, I like you to at least know who they are and sympathize with them and understand them and know that if you're seeing the world through their eyes, what they're doing is more or less right. Hmm. It's, just, it's just, it may be kind of antipathetic to everyone else in the story. Um, you know, and that for me actually is the thing that makes monsters. Um, you know, the, the, it's the point where you get a, a you're reading letters by, by German officers written during the Holocaust, um, writing home, saying, you know, tell little, little Willie that he should be working harder on his homework, and I'm sending you a bottle of apple brandy, uh, which you must drink to me before I get back, and I love you all, and I'm so proud of my men because we got an extra shipment. An extra train came in, and uh, they all worked really hard, and, and my men are so good, and I love you all. And you're going, okay, hang on, this is, this is an extra shipment is coming in. This is, an, this is a cattle train filled with uh, people that they were going to process into the camps and kill, and some of those people were dead, and this is a monstrous thing. And it's though that, that um, you know, the horrible terrible vileness of being able to look at things through those eyes that mm -hmm. allows us to connect as human beings with the monsters and hopefully to, to understand what it, what it is and, and to see the monster in ourselves. Um, the glory of the Duke is we may sympathize with him, um, but he is, he, he enjoys being the bad guy. And he seems uh, to know that he is the bad guy. He oh, said. He, he really does. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I always, when I, whenever I read to my kids, um, when, you know, the years that I have done it, I actually have this weird little head cast of characters. And it's a very <laughs> weird little head cast, because normally when I read a book, I just sort of try and do the character. But for 13 clocks, whenever I do the Duke, I try and do Peter Sellers' version of Laurence Olivier's Richard III. <laughs> so it's That's very specific. <laughs> thank you. And, and for the Gollocks, I was trying to do Marty Feldman. I, I consider it a great tragedy that Marty Feldman died before um, ever making a glorious animated film, or not so animated, of <laughs> because I can absolutely imagine Marty Feldman as a fantastic Gollocks. Oh. Um, and just on the subject of villains, I'm thinking of uh, the ocean at the end of the lane and that villain that you created there. 
how do you, she really seemed to have a backstory, and um, you sort of sympathize with her a little bit, even though what she was doing was destructive to the main characters. How, how did you get in her mindset? Um, is, is there, do you have a process that you do, or? No, you just try, I mean, what I tried to do in that story was create um, a story that was inevitable. And, um, you know, the inevitable things are somebody who, from their perspective, is doing good. She's trying to help these people. She's trying to be nice. And mm -hmm. really, the only thing that's a problem is this little seven-year-old boy. And seven-year-old boys are expendable. They're really irritating anyway. <laughs> you can see her point of view. Um, right. And she's, you know, uh, the fact that people are getting hurt while, from her point of view, she's going to have a wonderful time and make everything good um, mm -hmm. is, you know, too much like people I've known over the years. I, I always say that bad guys only go so far. Um, people, you know, it, it's not as I've grown older, I have occasionally run into people who were, for want of a better word, wicked. You know, as, as a, as a, as a 28-year-old, I didn't think I'd run into any wicked people. Now, at the ripe old age of 53, I've run into some wicked people, and that's been fascinating. Um, but I tend to find that, on the whole, they do less harm than some of the good people, because the ones hmm. who go out into the world convinced they are doing the right thing, and that the terrible things they are doing are for everybody's good, they tend to be monsters. Um, you know, I, I, and, and so I, that was the joy for me of creating Ursula Moncton, is she was one of those. She's absolutely just doing the right thing, and uh, collateral damage is possible. Thank you. Um, so we have a question on the character Haga from the book. Um, Haga is the character that cries jewels. For, for readers. Um, this is from Karthika. She says, I'm intrigued by the character of Haga. Her sorrow is exploited to the point where she can feel no more. The benefits of her joy are ephemeral. Is there a larger social parallel here? I don't know. Yes, quite possibly. Um, I don't know what James Thurber was actually thinking on this one, because mm -hmm. I am not James Thurber. Um, <laughs> And having read too many beautifully constructed academic treatises that proved exactly what I was thinking about something, which came as complete surprises to me, um, I, I always hesitate to go, well, yes, what he was obviously thinking was because, you know. But I think um, thing, some things are huge and obvious. The idea that tears of laughter are ephemeral, um, whereas the tears of sorrow uh, will last forever. Mm -hmm. It's obviously a bigger message, a bigger idea, um, than just a, a, a line in a book. Um, but having said that, of course, the joy is that um, he gets to do everything he needs to do with those tears of laughter. That's great. Um, so we have a question from Charles Lewis, and he said, I know the 13 clocks is unique to you and without classification, um, and you clearly love the use of language in the book. What other authors and titles give you the same thrill? Oh, what a lovely, lovely question. Um, I think, I mean, the, the glorious thing of this is it is unique, which means that I don't know that there's anybody out there that gives me the same thrill. But similar thrills, similar, similar glorious linguistic and fun thrills um, would be, there's an author named R.A. Lafferty, Raphael Aloysius Lafferty, uh -huh. from Tulsa, <laughs> Oklahoma, who died about uh, a little over a decade ago now. And Lafferty um, should have been, you know, he nobody ever noticed him. In, and by nobody, I mean the kinds of giant, glorious, mainstream places. You know, the New York Times book review never did a feature on Harry Lafferty while he lived. Um, 
But Lafferty could deploy language in remarkable ways, uh, which remind me a lot of both of folk tales and of tall tales, but also, also just, just of the, the, the joy of watching, putting, watching somebody put together sentences. Um, Flann O'Brien, um, mm -hmm. whose novels The Third Policeman and At Swim Two Birds, two very, very strange books, um, especially The Third Policeman, which <laughs> is, again, I mean, what The Third Policeman has going for it is it, it, is, it is an absolute unique book. There is nothing in the history of literature quite like The Third Policeman which may or may not be, um, uh, you know, it, it, it may or may not be a fairy tale. It may or may not be a murder and a crime story. It may or may not be about somebody who is dead hanging around in hell. Um, it could be all of these things and none of these things. Uh -huh. and that, um, although it's very much for adults, is, is a book that I would point to from which I get the same peculiar joy. Um, and uh, yeah, those, those, are, those are a few books. OK, great. Um, we have a, a question from Sharon Merrill, who commented on WSJ.com. And she says, I teach both creative writing and rhetoric at the high school level. Um, what specific passages would you choose to share with teenagers, and why? You know, the joy of 13 Blocks is that it's all good. Mm -hmm. um, it really is. It's, it's a, you know, I, I took earlier on in, in this Hangout, um, I took the first four or five pages because I didn't want to have to choose. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and it's glorious, um, but pl but but things that are really fun. Um, the the prince as a wandering minstrel. Um, his sequence is fantastic. The mm -hmm. introduction of the Gullocks, which teaches you. I, I would I would love to hear. Um, if I were a a teacher. Of of stuff. Um, of rhetoric, I would have people read aloud. Um, I am the Gullux, said the Gullux proudly. The only Gullux in the world are not a mere device. You <laughs> resemble one, the minstrel said, as Sarah Linda resembles the rose. I resemble only half the things I say I don't, the Gullux said. The other half resemble me. He sighed. I must always be on hand when people are in peril. My peril is my own, the minstrel said. Half of it is yours, and half is Sarah Linda's. I hadn't thought of that, the minstrel said. I place my faith in you, and where you lead, I follow. Not so fast, the Gullock said. Half the things I've been to never were. I make things up. Half the things I say are there, cannot be found. When I was young, I told a tale of buried gold, and men from leagues around dug in the woods. I dug myself. But why? I thought the tale of treasure might be true. You said you made it up. I know I did, but then I didn't know I had. I forget things, too. The minstrel felt a vague uncertainty. I make mistakes, but I'm on the side of good, the Gullock said, by accident and happen chance. I had high hopes of being evil when I was two, but in my youth I came upon a firefly burning in a spider's web. I saved the victim's life. The fireflies, said the minstrel. The spiders, the blinking arsonist, that set the web on fire. And so forth. I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a glorious sequence with the Gullocks. Um, Hagar and her tears is absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, it, 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 there are no bad passages, and it's an incredibly short book. It, mm -hmm. it, it's 40,000 words. It's, you know, four or five days read aloud, um, or, you know, one, a couple of, couple of glorious afternoons. Uh-huh. And what do you think the effect of the illustrations has on, on your reading experience? You know, you're kind of flipping through and there's these beautiful illustrations. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I can. I, I mean, I was fascinated because I came to the Mark Simon illustrations late in life. 
-hmm. I didn't discover them until I was trying to find a copy of The Thirteen Clocks as an adult to read aloud. Um, I definitely loved the Searle illustrations better. They were spikier and <laughs> odder. Um, if you Google Ronald Searle Thirteen Clocks, you can see what some of them look like and the, the peculiarity of them. The people were just weirder, grotesque caricatures, except for the prince and princess, who are almost grotesquely beautiful. <laughs> um, you know, they are so perfectly beautiful in this world of caricatures, they seem almost out of place. And um, the Maximons are much more delicate. They're gentle. And mm -hmm. I think they could fool you into thinking this was a gentle book. And it's not. It's definitely spiky. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. This is uh, from Cheryl, who commented on WSJ.com. She says, I can't help but wonder what might be an appropriate musical accompaniment to a performance reading of The Thirteen Clocks. Mr. Gaiman, what do you think? Oh, <laughs> I, what a lovely, lovely question. Um, I'm trying to think what would be fun. I think I would go and find things um, of a sort of folk tale-y bent. Um, go listen to bands like, like you know, Steel Eye Span um, and find some of their more musical stuff. And find the tunes that are folk tunes but done in a way that the folk people never did them because they didn't have access to things like electronic instruments and stuff. Um, that would probably be the way that I would go if I were going to build something. But um, either that or, um, you know, classic Warner Brothers cartoon soundtracks. <laughs> that would be great. Um, great. And is there anything that you wanted to add that we didn't talk about, about the 13 clocks? No. I'm really glad. Um, that we got to, you know, when the Wall Street Journal said, what would I like to do, you can do anything. That when I picked this, nobody said, but you can't do that. Because um, I figure that at this point, if we are going to spread the 13 clocks into the world, it will spread virally. And we will spread it by creating people who read it, love it, um, and want to read it aloud to other people. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here today, and thank you for guiding us through this book. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everyone out there on the Hangout. It's weird. I don't believe there's anybody. I, know. I think it's just you. I just... <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye.